Based on Le Transpersonnage, a French graphic novel, 2013 Snowpiercer was director and writer Bong Joon-ho's very first English language film. It opens with sound bites from the near future, where, in lieu of cutting carbon emissions, scientists seek to curtail global warming by dissipating a reflective chemical into the air. It works too effectively, and the entire planet freezes over. The only survivors of humanity live on the titular train in a perpetual loop around the planet. When we come into the train, we find ourselves in the tail section, and we see the miserable life that is led here. There are no windows, not enough beds, it's crowded and grim. They are fed only nondescript protein blocks. They are controlled and counted by armed men. And right away, we meet Curtis Everett, and get the first glimpse of his rebelliousness when he refuses to kneel when he is asked. He's trying to get a good look at the path out of the tail section, quietly plotting a rebellion. And if this were made by someone else, the story beats would be easy to guess. Curtis leads his revolution, unseats the tyrannical rulers of the train, and installs himself as a more enlightened and kind leader. But this is no conventional filmmaker at the helm of this feature, and this is no conventional narrative he's built. What we have in front of us is one of the most truly subversive and radical movies in recent years. Join me as we break down the perfectly melded allegories and parallels of Bong Joon-ho's Snowpiercer. We've already met Curtis and seen the terrible conditions that he and the rest of the tail sectioners live in. He plots his revolt in tandem with Gilliam, the de facto patriarch of the tail section, a role that he seeks to hand over to Curtis. But Curtis doesn't want it, which hints at a certain humility. We also see that Curtis is apparently good with kids, as evidenced in this scene. He's been getting messages from the front of the train with hints and directions, hidden in the protein blocks. A boy, Timmy, received the message block, so Curtis has to negotiate for it. Give me a pound. Blow it up. Hey, listen. I think I need that protein block. How about I trade you? This one for that one. The young gentleman with Curtis is Edgar, his eager right-hand man all too ready for action. His whole life has been spent aboard Snowpiercer, and was orphaned shortly after getting on the train. Your mother. You remember her? I can remember her face. Edgar also pressures Curtis to take up a role as leader. But again, Curtis declines, setting up what seems to be a familiar arc of growing into leadership. Life has churned on for 17 years in monotony, with regular deliveries of protein blocks and the occasional job to be filled. The soldiers ask for a violinist, an elderly couple approaches. However, the front section only needs one player, and the husband is asked to go alone. He refuses to part from his wife, and they brutally take him anyways. It drives home how in the tail section, people are little more than resources. This is made even more apparent a little while later when another one of the front sectioners shows up and begins to measure the children. Tanya tries to hide Timmy behind her, but at the slightest noise, he's found out, forcibly seized, measured like he's a mere thing before being taken away. The woman also takes a boy called Andy, whose father Andrew throws a shoe after them, an action that doesn't go unpunished. For his sentence, Andrew's arm is slathered in cream and sealed into a porthole, exposed to the harsh winter outside. We also meet Minister Mason, played by Tilda Swinton. Yes, that's Tilda Swinton, absolutely chameleoning herself into this role. This is so disappointing. C'est trop décevant. Es una muy grande desilusión. Chitza, manama. No, no, we don't need all that. I've only got seven minutes. Mason's job as comic relief is deftly handled, since she pulls double duty as a secondary antagonist. The approach adds levity to the movie in a way that also serves the story by showing how fallible the authority figures on the train truly are, giving us a similar measure of contempt as Curtis himself feels. Mason lectures the tail sectioners on their insubordination and the need to preserve order. We must, each of us, occupy our preordained particular position. And notice how the strange gesture reappears very shortly afterwards with a line that sounds distinctly religious. All water flowing, all heat rising pays homage to the sacred engine. In its own particular preordained position. In the midst of apocalypse, theocracy has taken hold, 
in a desperate attempt to maintain order and power. When the foot seeks the place of the head, a sacred line is crossed. Know your place. Keep your place. Be a shoe. Andrew's arm is removed, frostbitten beyond saving, and it's shattered for good measure. Gilliam hobbles forward with other amputees to comfort the man. Minister Mason, please deliver a message to Mr. Wilford. Certainly. What shall I say? Tell him. He and I need to talk. It's a haunting warning to Mason, foreshadowing what is to come. As the troops filter away, Curtis fixates on something that Minister Mason said. Put that useless gun down. Put it away. It could just be a remark about how the gun didn't phase Gilliam. But Curtis thinks that there's a more literal meaning behind it. That the guns aren't loaded. The bullets have gone, quote-unquote, extinct. Which, as a side note, Snowpiercer excels at these little tidbits of world-building. Little touches, like the linguistic drift of referring to items as extinct, or showing how with no cameras, the tail section has recorded the history and their people through charcoal drawings, paint a bigger picture without spoon-feeding us details directly. Anyways, they continue their preparations for revolt, but are interrupted by another delivery of protein blocks. Their materials are in the open. The rebellion will be found and snuffed out before it begins. Edgar begins a loud protest. The soldiers silence it quickly. Curtis eyes the doors, seeing that little sliver of opportunity. And at the same time, another message arrives. Edgar pushes him to jump on this chance. Gilliam urges caution. The message contains crucial info, but the time to check it would be too valuable to lose. Curtis drops the message. They've got no bullets! And all hell breaks loose as they jam open the access doors to the rest of the train. The Great Curtis Revolution has begun. They quickly surge forward to the prison car, where they hope to recruit a certain Namgung Minsu, a security expert who will be vital to the progress. When he wakes up, he's silent, appearing numb and barely cognizant of what's going on around him. He appears to be drugged out of his mind, which apparently is common among the front sectioners. They get high off of solidified engine waste, called Kronal, which Curtis has been collecting as a bribe for Namgung but he still doesn't seem responsive. Then, slowly, he pulls out a box of matches and cigarettes. Cigarettes have been extinct for more than 10 years now. He slides the matches to a kid, and then... This quick display of diversion is the first hint that this man is more than he appears. He strikes a deal to help the rebels, on the condition that Yona come along, and both of them receive a lump of chrono for each door they open. Curtis agrees, and so they push forward into the next car. It's been evacuated, and they find bunk beds, scarce lodgings for sure, but still better than what they had. They also find something they've not seen in 17 years. This can't be a window, can it? As they slowly adjust, they finally get a view of the outside world, and it's still frozen solid. We get a snapshot of the horror of the apocalypse, with people frozen alive trying to clamor for escape. As Namgung begins to open the next door, Yona speaks. He's running. Side note, this kind of clairvoyance is probably my only real critique with the movie. Yona is a train baby, born on the train, and in this environment, kids develop extra keen hearing. This is elaborated on outside the movie, but there aren't any clues to this phenomenon within the movie. And while it makes for a good moment later, it does stick out as a loose thread that would have benefited from a clearer setup. Anyways, the man jumping for the valve turns out to be a former tail sectioner, Paul, and he seems... different now. It's not the Paul I remember. No. He's the guy that's making their protein blocks, and they also find out the truth about how their food is made. I think it's worth mentioning at this point that when I first watched this, I was eating takeout. All this time we've been eating this shit. Hey, I eat them too, you know. 
every single day? That last remark I think is interesting. As we go through the train, we're essentially climbing the class pyramid of the society. And while Paul has climbed higher in the social hierarchy, that doesn't mean he's not subject to being demeaned either. And he seems totally okay with this. We're going to the front. Come with us. All right, you're going to the front? Yeah, man, but no way, man. My place is here, all right? They also find another capsule with instructions from the mysterious benefactor in the front. The only word written on it is water, which they interpret as a direction to an opportunity. If they can seize the water car only part way up the train, then they'll be able to make demands. Victory seems closer than ever, but Namgung begins to open the next door, and as Yona concentrates on what's on the other side, she's suddenly terrified. Don't open it. What? This whole sequence is one of my favorite action scenes ever. The music creates a raw sense of dread. The slow motion underlines the impending threat. The knowledge that this is going to be a long, hard fight. The rebels wield whatever tools they can, while their opponents flash deadly axes. And in a display of intimidation, pass around a fish, which they bleed upon their weapon blades. As an aside, this shot was one that the distributor Harvey Weinstein wanted to cut, but Bong Joon-ho and cinematographer Hong Kyung-pyo really liked it and wanted to keep it in. This was a back and forth that they had over many elements in the film. The full story is worth checking out. But for this particular scene, Bong Joon-ho told Harvey, This is very personal, family something, because uh, this is dedicated to my father. <laughs> so, <laughs> My father was a fisherman, and then uh, it's a total lie, of course. But, uh... Which I think is amazing. Back to the fight. When it breaks out, the sound design is brutal. The heavy swings, the crunching of bones. Compared to other action fights, you can hear the difference. The camera uses frenetic shots that blur and capture the heated moment, but the distinct designs help us to keep track of who is who in each engagement. And then it cuts to Curtis, wildly swinging and hacking away, with a brutality that seems to leave even Edgar shaken. But the fighting cuts off when one of the conductors shouts they're about to cross Yekaterina Bridge. The Axemen begin to pump their fists in the air, counting down. It's a tense moment for the viewer as you have no idea what's about to happen. And then... I hate getting older. I hate it. A great little comedic flourish that still keeps the tension high, and another fun bit of world building. Then, at the far end of the car, a familiar face emerges. Minister Mason, admonishing them all for their ungratefulness, accusing them of spitting in the face of Wilford's generosity, and delivering a chilling mandate. Precisely 74% of you shall die. With that, the Axemen slip on night vision goggles. The car begins to darken. Living in the tail section ever since the train started moving, of course Curtis and his compatriots wouldn't know that after Yekaterina Bridge, the train goes through a long tunnel and everything goes black. What follows is a slaughter, as Wilford's men hack at the rebels, a cold and methodical approach, sickeningly amusing for Mason. The car passes by a sliver of a crack in the stone, and we get this incredible shot of the action being lit up ever so slightly. A beautiful way to depict terrible carnage. But in the midst of it, Curtis remembers something. The matches that Namgung had slipped to the side earlier. Shin! We need fire! For the first time in years, a match is lit in the tail section. It's brought to a torch, and Andrew takes it up, charging to the front line. The music picks up, the whole energy changes. It's a thrilling counterattack, a renewed sense of hope as Mason reacts in fear at the renewed rebel spirit. The playing field has shifted once more. In the chaos, Chris manages to grab Minister Mason and stop the fighting. But in doing so, he declines to save Edgar, the young man who has looked up to him for years. The battle for the water supply has ended in victory for the rebels, but it's a costly, bloody victory. Gilliam hobbles forward, 
and directs the remaining men to wash themselves, to consolidate their gains, and plan on what to do next. Andrew and Tanya interrogate Mason, demanding to know where their children have been taken. Mason insists she doesn't know. Wilfred knows! Wil Wilfred! Wilfred lies, kids. <laughs> he, he does now? Okay, that's... Uh, okay. Curtis tells Mason to call Wilfred so they can negotiate, but it turns out that the water car wasn't the solution they thought it was. It only controls the water for the rear of the train. The engine produces the rest. She also calls Curtis by name. Yes? Wilfred knows you well, Mr. Curtis Everett. He's been watching you. Wilfred has indeed taken some personal interest in the tail section, and in Curtis himself. Mason proposes a deal. With her authority, she can take them safely to the front of the train, where they can then kill Wilford as long as she's allowed to live. And to finish her plea, she removes her front teeth, revealing them to be dentures, in a bid to make herself seem more harmless. Late at night, Curtis and Gilliam discuss their options. Gilliam asks if Curtis really wants to keep going, noting that so many have been killed and wounded already. But as long as they don't control the engine, Curtis knows that nothing will change. He plans to take a small team ahead, using Mason to make their passage easier. Once he takes the engine, he still intends to hand over control to Gilliam, who retorts that Curtis is so obviously the leader now. And then Curtis asks, How can I lead if I have two good arms? It's a strange line, accompanied by a reveal of a scar on his arm. Of course, they don't elaborate on it for the audience right now, because the characters already know how it happened. There's no, remember that time you hurt your arm line? No, the dialogue is written to allow the mystery to linger, and Gilliam moves to comfort Curtis. Can't do a lot with one, you know. Especially when you're an older woman. Much better to have two arms when you agree. The next morning, Curtis sets off with a small crew, and they press on into Snowpiercer. From here, the scenery changes. The first half of the movie was dominated by industrial-style designs. After the water car, they encounter a greenhouse. Namgung tells Yona about dirt, how they used to walk on it before the world ended. But then he gets distracted by something in the window. What it is, again, we don't know yet. Up next is an aquarium car and Mason offers for them to stop and eat. It's a rare treat. Sushi is being served, only one of two times a year it's offered. You see, this aquarium is a closed ecological system, and um, the number of individual units must be very closely, precisely controlled in order to maintain the proper sustainable balance. Curtis doesn't let her eat any sushi, though, instead demanding she eat the protein blocks fed to the tail section, reversing the roles, and it feels like a bit of sweet retribution. Up ahead, they then encounter a school section with kids in class. A totally normal and not at all terrifying class. What happens if the engine stops? We all freeze and die. But will it stop or will it stop? No, no! Can you tell us why? The engine is eternal, yes! The engine is forever, yes! This is not a form of brainwashing! This is not a form of brainwashing. This is really the greatest country in the whole world. Bong Joon-ho's skill for black comedy and satire is amazing. At that moment, the train passes by what remains of what they call the Revolt of the Seven, a group of passengers who years ago tried to exit the train and froze where they stood. And again, it's drilled into the children's minds. If we ever go outside the train... We all freeze and die. If the engine stops running, we all die. The education is interrupted by a delivery of fresh New Year's eggs from front sectioners, going down the cars and handing out the treats. We also see Gerald, the old man taken away before to be a violinist, and he's totally different. He's cleaned up, wearing a sharp new suit. It seems totally at ease in his new position, as if he's been doing this his whole life. But Curtis notices something in his egg, another red letter with a chilling message. Yes. <laughs> Andrew's shot down, Gray takes down the teacher, and then a broadcast is shown on the television, as Gilliam is dragged out and summarily executed. 
Curtis, despite his protests, now has to assume leadership of the rebellion, and his first action is to exact retribution on Mason. They go through car after car, and we see the scenery changing more. Up here, there's plenty of space. Rooms are set aside for dentistry, tailors, hairstyling. Along the way, they're pursued by Wilford's men. There's this one great shootout where the train takes a wide curve. Really creative idea here. They're eventually cornered in the steam room, with the fighting turning brutal, hand to hand. I want to point out three things here. One, there is this interesting little reference here with the music in the background. Do you recognize that tune? This will tie into the theme at the end, so keep it in mind. There's also this part, where Yona tries to deliver a blow, and her father stops her. He's been protective of her through the movie, which is what you'd expect for a parent and a child, but this is different. It's not just a concern for her physical well-being, it's a concern for her moral well-being, for her soul. But tragically, the story of another parent's love for the kid ends here, Tanya dying from her wounds. And the last thing she wants to see as she passes is the drawing of Timmy, her son whom she'll never see again. In the final stretch, we see entire cars devoted to raves, fabulous luxury and excess. You can see in Curtis's face how grim he feels, the shadows passing over him, a literal depiction of the darkness in his heart. And finally, he reaches the last door. Namgung seems more focused on his last chronal payment than getting in though, and he and Curtis come to blows, the frustration palpable. But as things calm down again, Curtis begins to open up, and the story he has to tell is harrowing. When the train first began running, there had been no food allocated for the tail section, and the desperate passengers began to turn to cannibalism. Curtis recounts a story of a cruel man with a knife, who made to take a woman's infant and eat it. The man killed the woman, but before he and his cronies could kill the baby, an old man, horrified by the violence, chastised them and cut off his own arm, offering it to eat. Inspired by his example, other people began to do the same thing. Probably guessed who that old man was. That baby was Edgar. And I was the man with the knife. And with this, Curtis's entire character dramatically changes. His reluctance to take leadership, his relationship with Edgar, his interactions with the other kids on the train, the self-doubt he expressed to Gilliam, are all recontextualized. He's a man with a dark past, a man trying to find absolution, and maybe, just maybe, he'll find it by taking the engine. So once again, he asks Namgung to open the door, but once again, Namgung refuses. <laughs> He begins to describe different signs he's seen during their advance. The frozen plain outside, showing that the snow is melting. New types of snowflakes, only made in warmer temperatures. And out the window of the greenhouse, well, he still can't see what that was yet but he believes the cold has abated enough to make life outside the train tenable again. And so Namgung proposes a wild solution. He has not been using his chronal, he's been stockpiling it, morphing it into a bomb, which he intends to use to breach the hole. But before he can get a match from Curtis, the last match on Earth, the engine suddenly opens. Curtis Everett. I've been asked to extend a formal invitation for Mr. Wilfred to join him for dinner. Curtis is greeted by Wilfred, THE divine, all-powerful Wilfred, who is just some old man cooking himself breakfast in his pajamas, and he begins to offer small talk. Curtis, of course, is standoffish, but Wilfred seems entirely nonplussed. Fuck you. Curtis, dear boy, the fact is we are all stuck inside this blasted train. 
he's very carefully quelling Nam Goom's idea, reinforcing Curtis's belief that there truly is no life outside this train, and as a result, everything within the train must be closely monitored and managed, including population levels. Just as Mason spoke of the fish, Wilford speaks of the people, and the need to keep the population down through subtle and less subtle means. <laughs> and he speaks of Curtis's revolution as if he'd known of it all along, even if it took some unexpected turns. That wasn't what Gilliam and I had in our plan. What? Another dramatic bombshell. Gilliam had been collaborating with Wilford all along, and at first it's unclear whether these are just mind games, whether Wilford is just toying with Curtis. But Wilford pulls out a phone and makes a call directly to the very back of the train, right to the spot Gilliam had lived. And he even brings up that old saying. Like Gilliam said, holding a woman is much better with two arms. <laughs> it's clear that the two had no real love for each other. One of the last things Gilliam told Curtis was to cut out Wilford's tongue. Wilford seems entirely dismissive that Gilliam was killed, as if he had it coming. But despite whatever animosity existed between them, they were in the same league. They had the same machinations, the same plan. The Ekaterina Tunnel was supposed to be the end of the rebellion, and it very well would have been too, if it hadn't been for Namgung's foresight. The grand design that Curtis has been forced into has more layers than he realized. Protest and rebellion have been accounted for, and even engineered to the benefit of the powers that be. Everything Curtis thought he'd been fighting against, he was inadvertently serving. He broke one cage, only to find himself in a second one. He's made it to the secret engine. Wilford even lets him stand within it. And yet, Curtis feels defeated. The train as an institution is stronger than he thought. Wilford, in this moment, seems truly invincible. And it's at this point that, in the worst way possible, Curtis is handed everything he ever wanted. I am old. I want you to take my station. It's what you always wanted. He invites Curtis to look down on the cars behind. Yona is caught up to her father, and they try to desperately fend off wild front section passengers, furious at the way they trampled through their cars and stole their drugs. Wilford remarks that this is human nature, that we devour each other, inadvertently, or perhaps very intentionally, invoking Curtis's terrible past. That's why they need the engine and the order it prescribes. And for a moment, it seems that maybe Curtis and Wilford's goals do align. For a moment, it seems that Curtis will take control, just as he wanted, just as Wilford wanted. But there's a fatal flaw to Wilford's argument, because the terrible crimes Curtis committed in desperation only happened because there was no food. The brutality came from the top down, entirely intentionally. We need to maintain a proper balance of anxiety and fear chaos and horror in order to keep life going. And it's illustrated most clearly when Yona hears something under the floor tiles. She pries them up to reveal Timmy mindlessly working, a living cog in the machine. And Wilford tries to pass it off like everything else. The engine lasts forever, but not so all of its parts. Thank goodness the tail section manufactures a steady supply of kids. So we can keep going manually. This, however, is too far for Curtis. All of Wilford's lies come crashing down, because with this reveal, we learn the engine is not invincible. It is not all-powerful. It has weakness. It can be destroyed. And Curtis tells Yona to get the bomb to do exactly that. He drops to his knees, trying to get Timmy out of the engine, thrusting his arm into the mechanisms. This triggers an alarm, and out from the shelves crawls Andy. Curtis tries to call out to him, but the boy doesn't respond to anything. Oh, Curtis. Don't be so melodramatic. You know everyone has their own preordained position. And this is when the true horror hits. It's not Wilford that's the problem. It's the train. In a lesser movie, Curtis would have taken the engine, almost killed Wilford, but let him live in order to not be just as bad as him or whatever, and then it end with a train intact and a voiceover saying that it was happily ever after. But that's not what Snowpiercer does. It's a radically anti-conservative movie, 
And when I say conservative, I don't want you to think of blue ribbons or red elephants. I want you to think of conservative in the truest sense of the word. A political stance seeking to conserve the existing balance of power. Conservatism is defined only in relative terms. Capitalists are conservative in the United States. Communists are conservative in China. The exact form the ideology takes changes based on what the institution is and who runs it. And I want you to consider this from different angles. The anti-capitalist sentiment has been obvious in this movie, but think about the other elements we've seen. Imagine how the image of an oppressive machine being patched with living human parts would have resonated in a Soviet republic. Imagine how the violent repression justified in the name of the divine would resonate in a theocratic Islamic republic. Institutions always seek to preserve themselves, no matter how many people, how many children, must be sacrificed to that end. Remember that reference to The Shining I pointed out earlier? A movie about a haunted hotel that turns people towards heinous atrocities? It is easier for someone to survive on this train if they have some level of insanity. The exact same thing is happening on this train. The people on the train who remember the world as it once was are either dying off or being transformed into compliant parts of the machine. The children are brainwashed into either zealotry or servitude. It's a future where humans are slaves not to each other, but to the unthinking machine. The train itself is an institution reinforced blindly. It is the worst case scenario for humanity. And there is only one alternative to a future of voluntary chains. The blast triggers an avalanche, and the train is wiped out. Wolford's magical train destroyed. And we only see two survivors, Yona and Timmy. But even in the devastation, the music gives a slight sense of hope. Because in the carnage, they are now free. Namgung is vindicated, as the snow proves survivable. And then they see what Namgung had spotted through the window, a sign that life will indeed go on. <laughs>